Hello friends, welcome to another episode of Blossoms and Bourbon. My name is Mark, and today I'm happy to welcome you back to Brady's Distillery here in Roanoke, Virginia. Uh, we're so appreciative that they allowed us to come back and film here, and as an added surprise, we're gonna get a tour of the facility and see what happens here. Um, for the floral portion, we spend a lot of time talking about mechanics in our work, and mechanics are super important, and we also love hydrangeas. Now, we're gonna look at how the hydrangea can be a mechanic for the arrangement. If you look at the growth pattern of the hydrangea, you can see it's got all those little fingers underneath, all those tendrils. So it works great as a mechanic because those little tendrils will hold flowers in place. So that's what we're gonna to do today. We're gonna to cut the stems fairly short at an angle, of course, so that they're tucked in and low. I made sure that those stems were kind of long enough to wedge into the corner of this square container so that there's some stability with them, okay? But then beyond that, we're going to just kind of work the flowers through the hydrangea. In fact, we often will use hydrangeas in wedding bouquets. And sometimes the designer will look at the recipe for the bouquet and see that there are hydrangeas. And she'll go, is this a flower or is this the mechanic? because they know that very often the hydrangea can serve as the mechanic as well as the flower. So um, it all plays into the design and how the design's gonna go. So I'm just adding some really, I don't even know what you'd call this color, but this beautiful deep sort of corally, orangey um, carnation. And I'm tucking them in first because I want them to be sort of not the feature flower of the arrangement, but uh, kind of a supporting element. And I think next I'm gonna go for roses. It's a beautiful shade of pink. It's so nice in this because it actually pulls in the color of the container as well. And that's something that as you're planning the colors for an arrangement, you might wanna take into account if you are making the colors work, not only for the atmosphere where the arrangement's going, the venue, the location, but also for the container. Um, I also say to the designers at the shop, let the container speak to you. <laughs> and sometimes I'll put the container on the table and go, I don't hear anything. Um, what that means is let the container kind of guide you as to what the arrangement should feel like or look like. Um, maybe we should just do a whole episode on that, you know, and how the containers kind of dictate the style of the arrangement. So this I'm thinking is gonna be something used on a table. It's gonna be something that's fairly low, which is why you can see this lower placement. Um, all the flowers connected to and work through the hydrangea. I was gonna use all those, but I think maybe I have enough. These um, beautiful zinnias are locally grown. They came to us from Sarah's Petals out in Fincastle. Really, really beautiful. And I like that it's sort of a transition between the dark color of the carnation, the softer color of the pink rose. It's kind of this beautiful sort of coral shade, which is awfully nice. There we go. That worked much better when I actually put it through the flower itself. Let's do one more of those up top. You do have to be somewhat careful working with zinnias because the stems are hollow. So sometimes even when you're holding them to cut them, you can kind of smush the stem and that is never a good thing. All right, gonna put a little greenery to kind of soften the edge. And this is gonna kind of help elongate the arrangement too visually, give it a little more line. So it already, you can see how that kind of pulls out the visual aspect of it. And I'm gonna do a complimentary one on the other side. Now, there was no tape or anything on this container before we started. Literally, the only mechanic that we're using here is the hydrangea. So, if you're moving this, you're gonna to have to be somewhat more careful with it because that whole thing will just lift right out of the container with no problem at all. Um, that can work in your favor, especially if you wanna change the water in the arrangement and you need to just lift it out quickly and flush out the container with some fresh water. Um, that would work great, but just beware. It's a little bit different than your standard mechanic might be. All right. 
Let's get something in that corner right there. And this Celosia is also a great color. Uh, this is a feather variety of Celosia, so it has those little plumes on it. We're going to use that also to kind of create an extension in the line. And you can see the line I'm creating is sort of almost diagonal. It kind of runs along the corners of the container, not um, really left to right through the center part of the square. All right, broke that into two pieces because I want to make the use of that. A smaller tucked in, a little smaller tucked in here. And then last but not least, I've got these sweet little button zinnias. So cute. And this, I want to leave these just kind of floating up a little bit so that there's a little more lightness about the arrangement. It's not all even in one surface level. A little more whimsical and fun. I love how these colors are coming together. All right, maybe a couple more snips of some greenery and I think we'll just about have this ready to go. All right, let's just give it a quick spin here. Yep, it needs a little bit of greenery in the front. So let's make that happen. You notice that I'm working in the bucket today because I don't want to treat their beautiful facility here like I do my workroom where I just throw stuff on the floor. Figured I'd be a little kinder to our host than that, so. All right, and we're gonna do one more rose right here in the front also. You can see this really does go together pretty quickly. Um, the prep is pretty quick because you're using one of your flowers as the mechanic. So um, it's great. You still see the hydrangea, but obviously the focus is not on the hydrangea in this case. If you wanted to play down the blue aspect, use a white hydrangea, and then it's going to kind of blend into the background even more. Uh, personally, I like the contrast of the blue with these other kind of warm colors, but um, a really quick and easy way to do mechanics. Be sure and treat the hydrangeas well before you use them. Uh, make sure that they're well hydrated. And even before putting them in this container, you could dip them in a little bit of alum. Um, alum will help keep those hydrangeas nice and fresh, as well as the other flowers uh, through the vase life that you're enjoying it. Um, I hope you enjoyed that quick and easy version of the mechanic. Thanks so much. Hang close for some more information about Brady's and a quick tour of their facility. Cheers to you and to flowers every day. Hey guys, uh, welcome back. Let me introduce to you Brian Brady, who's one of the owners here at Brady's Distillery. Uh, again, thank you so much for letting us uh, hang out here today and film a couple episodes. Um, please tell us about your facility, your process, how you got started, all that stuff. We'd love to hear about yeah, it. Yeah, absolutely. So um, as he mentioned, I'm one of the owners of Brady's Distillery. There's uh, three of us total. Um, my younger brother, Andy Brady, and my older brother, Tim. And how we got into this is um, basically, Tim was a, uh, in the Air Force for 20 years, he retired. Andy and I have had other businesses together uh, for years. And when Tim retired, he was looking for something to do. And he said, well, I've, I've always wanted to be in business with my brothers. So, um, you know, what, what can we do? Andy and I had been kicking the idea around for a distillery for at least 10 years. And okay. every year we kept saying, there's no distillery in Roanoke. There's still no distillery in Roanoke. And every year we thought somebody else was going to beat us to it. And then when Tim retired, it was like, well, this is the perfect thing to do. Andy and I had long moved on to bourbon instead of beer. Right. So while Tim was still a really good beer brewer, we, this, this is very, very similar. Yeah. Um, so we ended up uh, capitalizing on the fact that there hasn't been a distillery in Roanoke in 110 years. Yeah. And 109 years, excuse me. And uh, so we're the first and we're still the only distillery right now in Roanoke. So cool. So talk about the process. How is that similar to beer? What happens here to get bourbon? Yeah. So um, you can see our, our still set up behind us here. We've got our mash tun uh, over here, which is obviously very similar to beer we have. We actually have a corn whiskey right now fermenting in here uh, that we just made yesterday. So this will ferment in here for about five to seven days. And then once it, we cook it over here in the mash tun and then we'll move it from the mash tun over here to the, to the one of our many fermenters. Uh, and then we'll move it from this fermenter once it reaches our, our uh, desired alcohol content okay. uh, or specific, specific gravity. We'll move it from here and we'll move it over into the still. And then from that, um, from that point on, we'll start another another run over here, okay. Uh, another mash over here, and then we'll let it ferment while we're distilling over here. Once it moves over here, we'll just fire the still up and then we'll take what the alcohol content of this uh, wash right here will be uh, roughly nine to 11%. Okay. And then we'll run it through the still and then we'll do a couple stripping runs depending on what we're making. This is a corn whiskey. So if we're making bourbon, we'll do it a little bit different. 
If we're making a vodka, then we'll strip it numerous times. Okay. But if we're making a bourbon, it'll, it'll be processed through the still here. Um, we'll strip it through our column here. Okay. And then it'll go through our condenser here. And then once we condense it, we collect it in one of our multi tanks here. And what does stripping mean? So stripping means when we take the, the ferment from over here and put it in here, it's obviously still got all the, the uh, corn particular matter and stuff in it. Sure. When we heat this up to around uh, 200 degrees, uh, you'll start to get the alcohol vapor come through our whiskey helmet here. Okay. And then when that alcohol vapor comes up here, this is what's called the deflegmator. Um, and so the deflegmator will actually be what we throttle the cold water to, to determine how much uh, actually continues passing through to the condenser or how much of it gets uh, Get, gets run through these stripping plates. So inside okay. of each one of these sight glasses here is a stripping plate. So filtering sort of. Correct, uh, yeah. exactly. Okay. Uh, and the more you, the, the stripping run is basically your, your, um, your quick run to just get a clear spirit out of this side. It might not be, depending on what you're making, it might not be your desired flavor. So we have, this is, this is our tank that we collect our hearts in. And when you're doing any kind of uh, uh, distillation, you've got multiple um, layers of distillate that comes out. So the very first thing that comes out uh, is your four shots, and that's uh, we discard that. So we okay. usually discard about a half a gallon of four shots, and then you'll immediately start uh, running into what's called the heads. So we have this tank here, and this tank is actually divided into two. There's a, there's a divider in the middle here. Right. And then we have a diverter valve that we can divert our heads into this, into this section here. And then once you start getting into the really good distillate, and that's the fun part of the job because you – you can smell and you have to taste it. Right. So you can smell it, you put your fingers underneath it, and you can smell it. Um, you can tell when it's heading into what's called the hearts. And the hearts are what we want to keep. Okay. So once we have collected all of our heads in here, then we'll actually divert it and start collecting our hearts in here. Okay. As we start getting towards the end of the run, uh, we'll start getting what's called the tails. And the tails is another product that we don't want. Okay. So then we'll divert it again and we'll start collecting the tails and that'll be on this side. Okay. So we'll have the heads, the hearts, and the tails here, and the four shots we will have discarded. Okay. Um, this is what we want to keep. This is what we want to turn into good whiskey. Separating those are what, um, in, in our opinion, is what um, separates a really good bourbon distillery right. from somebody that just keeps all of it and, and collects it all. Gotcha. And you can taste that in the, okay. in the final product. We will take the heads and the tails and we will put them into the next run because there is still good alcohol in there. Okay. Uh, it's just trying to refine that um, that distillation good enough to where you can separate your 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 hearts, and that, which is exactly what you want. Sure. Um, we'll take that and we'll still get a little bit more alcohol from that. And then what we, what we don't use, we'll end up discarding. Cool, all right. Uh, this building, the facility that you're in, uh, does it have a history? How'd you land here? It's pretty cool. It is, it's a really cool property. As you, as you can see, we're, we're in what's called the DSP, it's our distilled spirits plant. So that's where we're licensed at, um, with the federal government and with the state. So this is our DSP and that's our tasting room over there. And that actually is a Virginia ABC store. Okay. So that's Virginia ABC oh. store number 488. Okay. So, um, anything that's made and processed over here is all, uh, federal. Um, and then once it's moved over there, it's, it, it belongs to the state, so the ABC store. So our, the property is really cool because it's got the two, the two buildings, which is very convenient for us uh, because they're already separated, which you have to do anyway. Right. We bought the building uh, roughly about seven years ago. Uh, we had a, a, another business. So Andy and I, one of the businesses that we owned together was a water restoration company, and we were running that business out of this property. Okay. And one of the unique things about a distillery is you have to have the property before you can apply for the permit. Well, the oh. permit takes approximately a year to get. Okay. So there's not a lot of people out there that are willing to go and lease a property or buy a property in the hopes that they'll get sure. a, um, a license. So anyway, we already own the property. And uh, when we started looking around for space, it, it took us a good six months of looking for other properties before we realized, well, why don't we just use the one we already own? Right. And, uh, and so, so, you know, we're, this is where we're at now. We ended up moving our business to another location, applied for a permit here while we were in the process of moving, we got our license. And uh, during that time, we tried to get as much history as we could on the building. So funny story about the property is we, we knew that it was a petroleum company before, before we purchased it. Okay. And uh, one day I'm sitting here bottling and a lady shows up and she says, do you mind if I take a look around? I said, well, yeah, absolutely. Uh, we're not open yet, but she said, well, I used to work here. And I said, no kidding. I, you know, now you got my attention. Tell that me everything so cool. you know about the property. So we ended up going inside to the office side, and which is where her office, right there on the corner, that's where her office was, and she worked here for 17 years as, uh, I can't remember the name, but Ferguson, some Ferguson Petroleum. Okay. And then so she gave me a little backstory on the building. and um, Oh, that's cool. And she told me what it was before that, which I can't remember. 
But then uh, another lady said that she used to walk to school up and down Pocahontas Avenue. She walked by here every day when it was uh, White House apple cider vinegar processing plant. Okay. And that was, I think she said that was in the 50s, I think. Okay. So the best we can find, that's as far as we can go back. Okay. That it was a White House apple cider vinegar processing plant. That is very cool. Which ironically turned into a distillery. Right, exactly. So, yeah. <laughs> you gotta love so, that. Yeah, so, so it's a really cool history on the property. I would love to know if anybody has any more. We ask people all the time. We've even put on our Facebook if somebody knows any more history of, of the property. We'd love to, right. we'd love to know. Right, so. right. Um, where do you want to be in five years? What's your, what are your hopes and dreams? We've, we've always had a, a pretty hard uh, goal for five years, and that is to outgrow this facility. Uh, we're already getting pretty close to that, and we've only cool. been open a year. So we started distilling in 2020. Uh, we opened our tasting room in 2022. So for those first two years, it was a lot of building, a lot of construction going on, a lot of licensing, and then a lot of distilling. So yeah. um, the plan was, it was always that when we opened this tasting room, we would outgrow this facility quite rapidly and we would move to more of a, um, a, a farm destination, if you will. Okay. Uh, the goal is eventually oh, gotcha. to grow our own corn, uh, to have a facility with a, a very large stage, and then have a rick house, you know, in the neighborhood right. of 50,000 square foot, right. where we can store barrels that we're not stacking them. I mean, this works, this works great. We've got two 40-foot shipping containers behind the building where we store okay. barrels in, and, uh, and that's great for now. But as we continue to grow, and running the still as much as we do, our, our goal is to produce a couple barrels a week. And as you can imagine, that's gonna fill this place up sure. really quick. So yeah. our goal is to eventually move to a place where we've got you know, 50 or so acres where we can grow our own corn. <clears throat> we can have a 50,000 square foot rick house and we can have a distillery that is, uh, I hate to use the word tour worthy, but whereas right sure. now we don't do tours sure. because we're so small, sure. uh, you can just take a peek in or you can walk around if we're open. Uh, we don't do actually do you know official tours, but that's right. that's the five year plan is to eventually outgrow this facility, move to another location, and this will this will become a specialty spirits place where instead nice. of making the seven products that we make now plus all of our experiments, right. this will be one product, and we're hoping that's going to be gin. That's yeah. our number one product right now. Right? Is it really our okay? Gin is, cool. Well, I shouldn't say that. Bourbon is our number one product, and it probably always will be. But gin is our number one um, seller that that was a clear spirit. Okay, so our gin is uh, we just recently won two international awards. Uh, we were first place in the John Barleycorn Awards in, um, in Europe. And awesome. we were second in best in class for um, uh, the San Francisco Spirits. Okay, nice, so that, congrats. So that spirit, yeah, we, and we just launched that uh, four months ago. Okay, so, uh, that's awesome. It, it's already, we've already had a, quite a tremendous feedback on it. Yeah. And uh, we're, we're expecting that if we move, this becomes a one spirit plant. Uh, which for the size of it would make sense. If we're only producing one spirit here, uh, then gin would be it. Yeah. So. Uh, last time we were here, Amy, one of your bartenders, mm -hmm. uh, made us a drink with gin in it. I'm not a gin guy. Mm -hmm. One of the best drinks I've ever had. It you was know? awesome. When we have people awesome. come here that want to try. Do you remember that, Jason? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, if somebody yeah. comes in here and they say, what are, you, what are you known for? Well, up until a couple months ago, we weren't known for really anything except locally being you know a local distillery right we're now on the map for gin and when people Sweet. tell me they don't drink gin i say you got to try this gin because yeah. it's unlike any gin when we when we created the gin it was an interesting story because most people what they'll do is d distilleries will take and here in the distillation process they'll put what's called a gin basket and that okay. gin basket is just an attachment that goes on to the gin and uh, onto the still and when the vapor comes across all the botanicals that are in there it, it picks up that flavor what comes out the other end is a clear spirit that has a gin flavor, your juniper, um, your star anise, things right. like that. Okay. The problem with that is, is if you're like us and you're primarily making bourbon, uh, it has all those oils from the from the um, uh, the botanicals, and it gunks up your still. There's a lot of cleaning that comes out. Okay. So uh, what's ended up being our best thing about the gin is the fact that it's not clear. Ended up also being something that saves us from having to clean the still yeah. all the time. We can, yeah, yeah. we can run bourbon through this and corn whiskey through this every single day if we want to. We never have to worry about it gunked up with botanicals and, and essential oils. Um, but we steep our spices in our clear spirit to make the gin, which the byproduct of that is not a clear spirit. It's about the color of champagne. Okay. Uh, the other thing about it is neither one of none of us are gin drinkers. So when we were making a gin. We said, let's make a gin that we like. Oh. And that, although yeah. a lot of a lot of people that that's the only thing that they drink, they may tear us up. They may tear us apart and say, this is this is not a very good gin. It doesn't have you know it needs more juniper. It needs more of this that. Right. Well, we don't care. We wanted to make a product that we want to drink. Right. Well, we did. 
and we all sip it, and it's really good over a cube. And uh, <clears throat> and the people that are in the gin community, they they fully embrace it. Yeah, uh, nice. But it's unlike any other gin that you'll ever drink. Yeah. Um, it is juniper forward, as it has to be for a gin. Sure. But it does have some other spices in there and some other um, flavors that we spent a long time. A lot of the secret months. recipe, as it were. The yeah. secret yeah. recipe. Yeah, we, we tell everybody <laughs> only about five of the of the spices that are in there. Right. And there's two that we. Yeah, we never really tell anybody. Yeah, shall remain nameless. Yeah, it's written over there on a on a whiteboard, but <laughs> the two that are that are missing are what gives it, you know, what we feel like that unique flavor. Yeah. Um, so so anyway, the the gin is not clear, and that is that is something that when you see it on a shelf, it's an immediate attention grabber. Because like, why is this not clear? And it, right. It's not clear because we steep them in the grain. Right. And then we filter it. And, right. Cool. Yep. That's awesome. Well, Brian, uh, thank you so much for Absolutely. having us. That's been great. I, um, I so appreciate the information and again, your hospitality. Absolutely. My pleasure. Um, yeah, thanks. Appreciate it. Absolutely. Thank you. Yep.